Good morning. Good morning. It is Saturday. It is Saturday, 8 a.m. It is April the 17th, 2021. Good morning. And I am happy to be here. It is Saturday morning, April the 17th, 2021. And we are still in the midst of doing our um, uh, duplex, working on our duplex. So this morning I'm going to finish this and then we're headed up to Greenville, South Carolina, where we are going to be painting again. So um, I am so glad you guys are here. It's been a busy week for me and I am super excited that I am here this morning. Um, I forgot to switch something off on my computer, so I think I'm just going to leave it. Um, hopefully it won't mess up everything. Oops. Um, hopefully it won't mess up anything. Uh, I've had an, a, a busy week. Um, I spent the Thursday evening at the ER with my youngest daughter who ended up having a kidney stone and we were supposed to go to a wedding yesterday which we ended up not going to because of her kidney stone and I didn't want to leave her alone. So I am excited to be here. I wanted to give you my little um, speech thing that I do every week uh, at the beginning of this program, which is since dementia is complex and managing challenging behaviors is very time consuming, we know at the baffled brain that finding reliable information quickly can be very difficult. Therefore, this weekly hour-long Facebook Live brings you an accessible place to ask your dementia-related questions because providing care partners like you reliable information and actionable strategies give people with dementia their best quality of life, delaying their decline and decreasing caregiver burnout. So, welcome to the Baffled Brain, Demystifying Dementia, the weekly hour-long Facebook Live that will teach you everything you want to know about de how to manage dementia. Today is April 17th, 2021, and this is episode 21. I cannot believe that we are at episode 21 already. And I am your host, Lizette Kluta from Think Different Dementia, where we believe caregivers deserve reliable and accessible answers to questions, because providing them with reliable information and actionable ch strategies will give you and to the person with dementia your best quality of life, improve your relationships, and delay the decline of the person with dementia. So I am happy to be here this um, Saturday morning. I'm trying to figure out what's going on over here. Um, I, there are four ways for you to connect with me. Um, I put a link in there for my calendar. If anybody wants to uh, just chat with me, you're welcome to sign, you know, to send me a message and we can set up a time. Um, I do have a website. It's still in the process of being developed, so we'll stick with that. Um, I have my own private Facebook group called Think Different Dementia, and then you can um, check me out on LinkedIn as well. So there's lots of different ways for you to um, be able to connect with me. So I cannot see my comments again this morning, so I hope that um, you guys are doing well. I see there are a few people out there. Um, and my comments have all the way gone away. Uh, so who knows? Today we'll fly by the seat of our pants again. I see there's a comment, but I cannot get to that comment. Uh, I don't know where they go. This is so frustrating. Um, all right, well, I cannot see my comments this morning, which means that my comments will be out there later on. Um, Let's see. Pop out. All right. Well, we'll try it this way. I don't know if this will work. Hey, Melissa. Great. I don't know if I'm still live, but um, I, yeah, I can do it that way. I don't need to see myself. My cat just did something stupid. All right, guys. So this morning, I have a whole list of questions. If you have questions, please throw them in the comments. I'm going to kind of go back and forth between the two. Um, if you have any questions, this this space is for you. This space is for you get, uh, for you to ask questions. And so, if I have a question um, in the comments, I will as answer them. Otherwise, I have a list of questions that I've generated. So here's a question from Lisa. 
Lisa said, I'm caring for my mother who has dementia. Her wish is to live in her home for the rest of her life. It has been recommended for hospice from her physician. Please give us your experience and advice on this situation. I think this is a great question. Um, and I will tag Lisa in this later on just because I know she probably isn't watching. Um, so how do you how do you answer this question? So how do we how do we even break this down? I'm caring for my mom who has dementia. She wants to live alone in her home, or she, her wish is to live in the, her home for the rest of her life. Her physician has recommended hospice. Um, so that doesn't really tell me a lot about how mom is moving or how mom is actually functioning. But I do. I personally believe that we are waiting too long with our people, our loved ones with dementia, to actually get hospice involved. So let's talk about hospice for a minute. Hospice is something that people are petrified of and they really shouldn't be scared of hospice. Hospice, especially here in the United States, hospice can offer you a lot of additional services, a lot of additional support for you in your own home. And so when when we when we as care providers like physical therapists, occupational therapists, nurses and doctors and things like that, as we look at the situation, we're looking at a bunch of different things, right? We're looking at how the person is functioning, how that individual with dementia themselves Themselves is functioning. We are looking at um, how the environment is set up and we're looking at the care provider. Um, and we are also looking at how can we get the, the person with dementia their most um, benefit uh, in their own home. And so sometimes people who are the care providers, the care, care partners of people with dementia, don't know all of the different buckets of benefits that we have here in the United States, right? And they are just looking at it from a, I'm trying to take care of my loved one as best I can. Well, hospice has some additional benefits to you that you do not have in any other place. Hospice can provide you with um, equipment that you cannot get uh, based off of how the person is functioning. Uh, you, uh, hospice is supposed to provide you with whatever it is you need. If you need a hospital bed, if you need a wheelchair, if you need a walker, if you need a lift, if you need any of these types of equipment, hospice can actually help. Hospice is also able to bring in people like a nurse. Um, just because you're on hospice doesn't mean that you cannot actually have therapy. It is a little known thing that hospice is supposed to provide therapy if the person needs therapy. Now, um, the, the type of therapy is a little bit different. The type of therapy that a person on hospice would be benefiting from is not um, uh, improvement. It's not things to make the person better, Lisa. It's things to help you help take care of the person better. It's caregiver education and training. So your physician has recommended hospice. Hospice definitely is something that I want you to look at. Um, there are a couple of ways you can you can play through this. You could always start with um, asking the physician to start with, say, you hear what he's saying, you hear she's appropriate for hospice, but can we maybe start with home health where you can get physical therapy, occupational therapy, nursing, nurses aid, social worker, things like that involved in her care to see if there's anything that they can do to help you um, in her Medicare Part A benefit bucket first. Um, and then if she really isn't able to benefit from that then transition to hospice. That's sometimes an easier transition for people. Now as to what you said, her wish is to live in her own home for the rest of her life. That is a tough question to answer. Nobody can answer that question for you but you. It is I know my mom and dad, so I can only speak to myself and I can speak to to my patients and the people that I've helped over the years, right? My mom and dad are currently still living on their own. I have actually said to my mom, I will keep you, if my dad passes away, who's her primary caregiver, I will keep you at home as long as I'm able to. But I'm not promising her I'm going to keep her in her own home for the rest of her life because I cannot promise that. It may not be a realistic or a reasonable expectation for your mom to be living in her own home for the rest of her life. 
And the reason I say that is you cannot anticipate what kind of behaviors she may start to have. You cannot anticipate uh, the fact that you might not be able to physically provide her with 24-hour care for the rest of her life. You may not be able to anticipate that her, her, um, her dementia may continue on for two years and your situation may be that you literally cannot provide that level of care to her for the rest of her life in her own home. So even though it is a noble goal to keep somebody in their own home for the rest of their life, it is not necessarily realistic or feasible for every single person out there to actually do that for their loved one. You have to do what is best. You, you know, when you're when you're making this decision, you have to make this decision to the best of your ability with the information that you have in your own home. You cannot promise her that she that you can keep her at home for the rest of her life. You can promise her that you will always love her. You can promise her that you will always make the best decisions for her. You can promise her that you are always going to be walking with her through this process, but you actually cannot promise her that you will keep her at home for the rest of her life. There are people who can. There are people who, despite the fact that uh, they probably shouldn't be at home um, anymore, like I have a situation right now in, in my practice that I'm working through, um, I have a couple of patients who should not be home alone, and they're home alone because their care providers all have to work, but they're not actually safe to be home alone. So what do we do in a situation like that, right? We do the best we can. Um, so. Lisa's question was, she's caring for her mom, her wish, her mom's wish is for her to live at home alone for the rest of her life. The physician has recommended hospice um, and give us your advice and situation. So I kind of broke that out for her a little bit. I'm going to tag Lisa in this later on. I hope um, she'll watch this again. So. I know from experience it's a very difficult question to answer. Nobody can answer that question for you on your own. Um, you have to make the best decision you can. Hey Gloria, welcome. If you have any specific questions, please throw them out there. Otherwise, I'm just going to be answering the questions I have here on my list. Um, so I have a couple of questions that people have, have asked me. Here's one from Emily. Um, she, her question was, I heard a nurse saying television was bad for people with dementia. Why? I thought this was an interesting question. I actually think television is bad for everybody, even though I watch TV myself. Um, I've gotten to the point where I'm not watching television per se. I'm watching um, programs on TV. But let's talk about why is television bad for people with dementia. I think that is a super great question. Um, Television is a very passive pr thing, right? We re really don't need to do anything if we're watching television. If we're watching something that is engaging and we're actually having to use our brain, uh, that could be a little bit different. But it, just the fact that a television, you know, I walk into people's houses. I'm an occupational therapist by background and training. And so I'll walk into people's houses and the, all the blinds are down, the room is dark, and the TV's on. <clears throat> and then Granny's sitting in the chair, and everybody's like, "Well, she's just she's watching TV." No, she's not. The TV's on, but she's not watching television. It is background noise. It is totally there for everybody else in the environment. Like if you go into a nursing home, right, and the television is on in the day room. My opinion is the TV is not on for the people who are sitting in the day room watch, watching television. The television is on in the background for the staff walking around, um, going from room to room, and they'll maybe come in and see a program or watch what's on the news or watch something going on. But that person with dementia is not necessarily watching television, especially as they're, as they're um, dementia progresses. And so the other part of it, Emily, is that um, a television doesn't actually, a few things, 
Blue light actually disrupts your sleep, so if there is a computer or blue light on in the bedroom later on at night, it can actually disrupt a person with dementia's sleep patterns and they may actually struggle to sleep. Um, and then it's also just, it's like I said, you know, there's really nothing that you have to do when you're watching TV. So I, I think that if we can, I think there are better things that we can do. We can put some music on, especially music is so highly underrated for people with dementia. We don't tap into music as much. Um, whatever their, whatever their, um, whatever their favorite music was, things like um, hymns if they went to church, putting on hymns in the background, other kinds of things that are that are even, uh, you know, um, still considered maybe passive. But having music, you know, and trying to tap into music can get people to sing and things like that, that um, really can change their interactions with you or even singing with them. So, Emily, I agree with the nurse. I don't think television is good for people with dementia. Um, I don't know if, um, if Melissa's out there, if she has any statements to make about that, uh, but I definitely don't think it's a good thing. Um, everybody out there, I still see a, a few people out there, please ask me questions. These, qu This is for you. Uh, this hour long is for you. My hope and desire is to actually get questions from you on live and answer your particular questions. Uh, that means that I can um, interact with you. We can dialogue back and forth through the comments. Um, I am an occupational therapist by background and training. There are a few ways you can get a hold of me. You can join my Facebook group called Think Different Dementia. You can message me. Just message me. My name is Lizette uh, Kluta OT. You can just message me on Facebook Messenger. Uh, you can. Um, you can email me at Think Different Dementia. There are a couple of ways that you guys can get a hold of me. But this hour is for you. This hour is for you to ask me questions. If you have a question, throw it out there in the comments. Um, I see when a comment is coming up, and I figured out a way that I could do this today. So it makes me feel a little bit less stupid than the last couple of times I've come on live. Um, so I have no more. I have. Uh, there's not a question out there right now. So I'm going to answer another question here on my handy dandy cheat sheet. Um, so I'm going to start with the questions that the people asked me last night. So Lisa asked, um, I found this one pretty interesting. Lisa asked, my mom's mobility has declined more rapidly than her memory um, and she has aphasia. I find this odd for Alzheimer's. She was diagnosed four years ago at 73. So Lisa, this is a great question. I actually had to go do a couple minutes of research before I got on here. Um, memory, so every Every type of dementia actually looks a little bit def different. And Alzheimer's, this does actually sound a little odd for Alzheimer's, especially the aphasia part of it. So Alzheimer's truly can only be, at, at least as far as I'm still aware, truly be definitively diagnosed upon um, autopsy. I'm not sure that it can be diagnosed definitively any other way. Um, but, you know, the aphasia part of it makes me wonder if she has a different type of dementia. Dementia is an umbrella term, right? Dementia is just like um, throw everything into the garbage can. Let's just throw it in the salad. Let's just throw it all in there. Dementia really just means out of one's mind uh, or dementis, out of your mind. So dementia is a umbrella term and underneath dementia you have all these different types of dementia. You have Alzheimer's, you have mixed dementia, you have frontotemporal dementia, you have um, vascular dementia, you have Alzheimer's dementia. There are all these different types of dementia. And so sometimes when physicians are diagnosing it, they will, um, they will um, say somebody has Alzheimer's dementia. But what it sounds like, and Gloria actually threw it out there as well, it actually sounds like your mom may have a different type of dementia. And I'm not a physician, I cannot diagnose this, but when, uh, when you have aphasia throwing things um, out there for people, 
uh, you know, you've got to start to think of a different type of dementia, especially in light of the fact that um, if if she, if you had thrown out there that she might have some challenging behaviors, um, it would definitely sound to me like you might want to consider, Lisa, and I'll tag you in this um, post la later on, you may want to consider seeing if she doesn't have a different type of dementia. Um, and Gloria used frontotemporal frontotemporal dementia and with frontotemporal dementia there's there's subcategories and one of them is primary progressive aphasia and so I wonder if you know in light of the fact that she has aphasia if you're not looking at a different type of dementia and then the other thing is don't rule out a stroke did she have a type of a stroke that has affected her um, her her um, ability to speak. So I I would encourage you, uh, Lisa, to to consider looking and seeing whether whether she doesn't have a different type of dementia other than Alzheimer's dementia. So that was a question that I got last night. And Melissa, yes, passively watching television isn't good. Being supported by a care provider or caregiver with reminiscing, social interaction, stimulation can be beneficial. Um, for you guys out there watching, uh, Melissa and I know one another outside of Facebook. Um, Melissa is also an occupational therapist. It's great to have her out here. Uh, we all are here to support you guys. We want to be here as resources for you. So please, if you have questions, Facebook friend Melissa as well or Facebook friend me um, and ask your questions. That's what we're here for. Um, and so the next question that I got was from Dan. Dan haha, asked a question about, guess what, everybody's favorite thing, sundowning, right? Um, so Dan's question was, Melissa's, uh, I'm sorry, Melissa, I read your comment and then I looked down and Dan's question was, any thoughts on how to lessen agitation that seems to start about 5 until 7.30? Um, he, he supports, I believe, his wife. Um, I kind of get to know people through here, so if I'm wrong, Dan, forgive me because, you know, there are lots of you guys out there. Um, but any thoughts or questions on how to lessen agitation that starts around 5.30 until 7.30? She argues and fusses about everything. Um, and Glenda answered on there that sundowners. And Dan, it very well may be sundowners. Um, there are lots of, sundowners is a hard is a hard one. Um, there are lots of reasons for sundowners and there's lots of things that you can try, Dan. The problem is that sun, um, every, so th your mom, great, thank you, not your wife, your mom. Um, a lot of, there's a lot of things that play into sundowners uh, and there, and each person is so, and I know this sounds frustrating to people to hear, uh, but every even though dementia has similar characteristics, right? Even though dementia has um, global things that we can see and they're, 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 we can kind of cluster people together in certain things, right? Dementia is very specific. And the reason for that is because we are all specific and individual, right? None of us are the same, um, and our environment isn't the same, and our care providers aren't the same, and our unique um, uh, natural resources aren't the same. And what I even mean by natural resources is our own um, our, our own how we developed and our own experiences and what we were in contact with, whether we were, you know, highly, whether we had the highest IQ or the lowest IQ. Each person is different, and so each person's uh, journey is different, and each person's triggers and each person's um, things that they exhibit, their their challenging behaviors are different, and so it's not a one size fit all. We cannot throw, you know, I, I can sit here and I can, I can give you suggestions, Dan, I can give you some ideas for you to try. But without working with the person individually and specifically regarding their individual and specific surroundings, caregivers, everything it is uh, these are just very educated guesses and melissa can um help me with this as well and melissa went exactly where i was going to go next 
everything that a person is doing when they start to show behaviors, Dan, is their a, their way to try to communicate with you. They, a person with dementia starts to lose the ability to um, communicate what's going on in them. So between 5 and 7.30 at night, let's look at a couple of things that um, are um, possible uh, possibilities. Mom's tired. It she was it there's too much going on, right? I don't know what the home situation is. Uh think about, you know, I, I, is it just you and your mom are you trying to cook? There's a lot of activity going on. Are you trying to do uh, her shower? Is there a caregiver coming in? Is there a lot of other activities going on? Is she bored because she's been uh sitting all day not being engaged in activities? Did she go to an adult daycare and now is exhausted and her brain's fried and she just cannot uh, tolerate it. Um, all of these, all of these things um, are things that you need to know. So Melissa, Melissa's 100% uh, correct. I call uh, it's called a, 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 a behavior diary, right? Or a journal. Start to write down everything. What happens before, during and after. Um, think about things like, um, who was there? What time of day does it happen in a specific place? Literally everything, and it sounds overwhelming, but the more you start to write it down, the better you um, can start to see what triggers her behavior, right? So you want to think about, um, like Melissa said, her roles and habits and things like that. But without knowing the pattern to the behavior, um, Yes, I know that Melissa. I'm I'm so proud of you. I I think that's I and Melissa just published a behavior diary, so I think you can go get it on Amazon. Um, and I Melissa throw the link out there for him because I think it's helpful. But Dan, you cannot all, only um, write down the stuff that's going bad. On the day it goes well, so say Tuesday between five and seven thirty, mom doesn't have these behaviors. Write down what that pattern and be what those things were because it it's helpful to know what triggers it um, and you know it could just be a bad day right um, and so you want to try to to find the day that it's good right if we only know what happens when it's bad we don't know what to fix or to change so you got to write down the day that things are good too so if you're writing down that um the bad times and then the good times then maybe you can start to see a pattern however if that doesn't work then i am um both melissa and i do consulting uh we both do consulting we are dementia specialists this is what i do i live eat and breathe dementia like i said i can only um I can only help you in generalities on this, but I could help you more specifically if you wanted to or if you needed to. So please, if Dan, if you're if you're interested in in a more uh, formal relationship or even just messaging me privately, please reach out. I'm I'm here for you. Um, and then Melissa um, asked uh, Joe about her mom. Uh, Joe, I'm so sorry for your mom's loss and happy birthday to mom. Um, she was a hardworking hairdresser for many 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 years uh, shout out to Joe I think Joe's mom just recently passed away um, I think it was recent right Joe um, throw that out there in the comments for me Glenda thank you for being here I'm so glad to have you um, I hope you know that I was joking with you earlier on the other question where you had said oh thank you thank you Joe I appreciate that um, uh, Joe, uh, Glenda's sweetheart is in a memory care around the f around the corner. Some people feel guilty, but it just becomes no choice. Um, I got to read this because uh, let's see, it just becomes no choice. Maybe you can help us with your input. You know, Glenda, I actually answered that earlier today. I a hundred percent agree. You know. What I said at the the first person who asked a question this morning, um, the question was, I'm caring for my mother who has dementia. Her wish is to live in her home for the rest of her life. She has been recommended for hospice from her physician. So Glenda, here's what I say. I think every person, you know, there are people that are like, no, 
Nobody needs to ever go to a facility. There are people that are like, no, you always keep people at home. They, uh, you cannot say that. That is that is totally wrong. Every person's situation is different. And if your sweetheart is in a memory care facility, I know that you, Glenda, made the best decision for you and your sweetheart that you could. Nobody don't so don't feel guilty about it guilt is a um so what is guilt right um guilt is actually a legal term if you think about it so i'm a christian i'm a believer i'm sorry if that offends some people but i just have to i just have to come about this uh, i am me this is who i am i am a christian i'm a believer in the lord jesus christ and guilt is a um is a legal term, right? We are all born and conceived in sin, and because we none of us uh, follow God's law, we are guilty. That is what guilt is, right? We are guilty in front of a holy, righteous judge that we have not followed his laws. So guilt is a legal term. Guilt is, that. that's not what you should feel. Do not feel guilty, because that means that you have done something wrong, right? When you put your loved one, Glenda, when anybody puts their loved one in a facility for whatever the reason is, um, you have to remember that you loved your husband, you loved him for many, many years, you have been his support system, and you are his advocate. And if you as any individual needs to put, if they need to place their, their care, their the person they've been caring for and their loved one in a memory care facility or any kind of facility what you what you're doing is because you're doing it for the best of everybody involved you you know when we when it's very easy for us as care providers to say you should keep someone at home right i you cannot say that to people if there's a physical reason for somebody not to be caring for someone else at home, if you're a petite five foot zero and your husband six foot six, there may be very practical reasons why he shouldn't be at home with you because you cannot take care of him. Um, if you are, um, you know, a, 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 a small person or you have your own health care problems um, and you're putting your and and not and trying to take care of someone at home means that your health is going down the toilet that's not fair either so what I say to people is that I know I know without a shadow of a doubt every single person on here is doing the best that they can they are doing the best they can to provide the level of care that they can for their for their loved one. So when you when you need to put somebody in a facility, you need to put somebody in a facility. That doesn't mean that you don't love them. It means that you really do love them. It re it means that you have their best interest at heart because it means that you realize, Glenda, that you cannot provide the level of care that they need anymore at home. So don't feel guilty about making the decision. Anybody out there, do not feel for a second, do not feel guilty for, for placing, for making the decision for everybody because, you know, there, there are extraneous circumstances. No one can make that decision for you, not even your children. Your children cannot make that decision for you if um, whether or not it's the right decision to keep someone at home. I know Joe Joe kept her mom at home, uh, but I know that um, Joe had a significant um, support system in place. And so every person's circumstances are different. People have different um, uh, natural resources available to them. Uh, we don't know what the circumstances are, so don't feel guilty if you have to place a loved one in a facility, if you have done the best you can, um, because you, you, as their care partner, you as their husband, as their wife, as their child, um, as their parent, you always are going to have their best interest at heart more than anybody else in the entire world. So hope that it makes you feel better, Miss Glenda. Um, I know and I trust that you did absolutely everything you could to take care of your husband at home. Um, and I'm proud of you for taking his best interest at heart and putting him where he is getting the care he needs. And uh, your your best 
thing that you can do now, and I know it's kind of hard with COVID, but be his advocate. You can still be his advocate even though you don't have as much access maybe, um, but hopefully things are opening up a little bit more. Um, it's been a lot of harder right now um, related to that, so I, I, I feel for people who have been in your situation. Um, so man, I can ramble. Um, Lisa asked another question. She's like, hey, Lizette, it's been a while since I wrote. We've been very busy in the greenhouse. So Lisa also is a pastor's wife, um, and she has a greenhouse, and her dad has dementia, and she is taking care of him um, at home. And um, she takes, it, uh, she says, it's very busy in the greenhouse. Dad is okay. I had to take him to a women's group meeting on Thursday since she's the president, so he had to go as well. He was perfect and sat and listened and enjoyed his meal. No oddity. Afterwards, I was so thankful, but then that night, he actually just walked around his room until 2 a.m., decided he didn't need any clothes on, wrapped himself in a blanket, and slept in a chair. Here was her question. Does he really not know me or how to do much without... He, here's her question. He really doesn't know me or how to do much without assistance, but he's starting to recognize places we go in church and neighbor's house and my son's house. What is this... Um, he doesn't truly understand hardly anything, but he knows where we're going. And so, Lisa, I'm um, I'm actually not thinking that he knows where you're going. Um, this I found this a great question. Um, I honestly wonder whether your dad doesn't recognize routines, right? Um, so you have a you're in a you're in a very busy household you're in a very busy time of your life you're a pastor's wife you have um all of this stuff going on right and so um you have a fabric to your life right you go to church on certain times um and for people with dementia routine is their friend right so the more structured and routine you can keep their life the m better they do so your dad is not necessarily recognizing where you're going he's recognizing the um the fabric of your life the structure of your life right you have a meeting on thursday you always go to um you you go to the greenhouse you go to church on sundays you have all of these uh, structured things in your in your world and he's recognizing sometimes the structure I truly believe a lot of people with dementia are highly understimulated, and Lisa, uh, Melissa can speak to that as well, right? Back to the, the conversation about television and dementia, right? So I believe people with dementia are significantly understimulated. Um, and so keeping him in this fabric of your life um, is probably helping keep him uh, somewhat active. What might have happened, though, and this is where you need to kind of write things down, right? Back to Melissa and her book she just put out. Um, a behavior diary is very, very helpful because without diarizing this Lisa it's really hard for us to be able to say okay um, you know and you've got to be specific uh, you have to be very specific how long were you out of the house um, how busy was it when you were there uh, what time did you get home did you go to the store afterwards all of these details uh, because because he may have there may be a tipping point in his brain where he is um, doing well up until a point and then you go home and he has a little bit of downtime but if you go over that tipping point and you may never know until afterwards um, that's what's what triggers the behavior so you kind of have to you have to play around with some of this and see um, and so you want to you kind of want to write it down you want to write it down and you want to try to um, make sure that you know that you know it might be it might have been just a little bit too much that one day um, for your dad and for his brain um, so um, yeah it's interesting that he that he um, took his clothes off I mean a couple of things that jump out at my at me at that time is um, was he hot and he didn't know what to do or you know was he uncomfortable the clothes were uncomfortable or um, you know that he just really there, there's a lot to that so if anybody out there has any questions I am 
I have about 20 more minutes. Um, I'm here to answer your specific questions. I am here specifically for this group and to and, uh, to to serve you. Um, my name is Lizette Kluta. I'm an occupational therapist by background and training. So I don't just come on here and speak for no particular reason, but I actually do have a background. I'm a dementia specialist. And there are three primary ways you can get a hold of me. You can message me on Facebook. You can join, uh, which is Lizette Kluta OT. You can um, reach out to me and join my Facebook group. It's called Think Different Dementia. Um, you can um, you can look at um, uh, yeah. You can email me, thinkdifferentdementia at gmail.com. Uh, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel, Think Different Dementia. Everything's Think Different Dementia. Because, and why did I pick that name? I picked Think Different Dementia because I want people to think differently about dementia. I am so... I have been a therapist for almost 30 years and I am so tired of people saying there's nothing we can do, there's nothing we can do. There's so much we can do to keep people with dementia at their highest level of ability. I am so tired of people being, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, I'm so tired of people just feeling like it's hopeless and helpless and that there's nothing that we can do. I strongly encourage anybody out there who is watching, I encourage you, if you do not have a good support system around you and you need to look for us, we are out there. There are physical therapists, occupational therapists, social workers. Um, there are people in the uh, broader community who specialize in dementia and we are good at what we do when we when you specialize in dementia you can help people with dementia live their best quality of life we can decrease the delay um, we don't people with dementia do over time decline but there is so much that we can do did you know that there are actually things there are exercises there are brain exercises that you can do and I'm not talking about just basic things right I'm talking about truly working in your brain um, that that occupational therapists can work with you on with your loved ones with dementia to maintain their highest level of ability um, I so badly want people to um, I so badly want people to be able to um, keep your keep your keep your um, brain as active as possible there are things that we can do to change diet to increase brain function Melissa yes the stigma keeps people from living their fullest life and that that is why I am doing this because that's why I called my company think different dementia because it, people it is it, yes it is a progressive thing but it is not hopeless and yes the person may decline over time but guess what we can delay that decline why would we, why would we not want to why would we not want to change um, how we are doing things people with dementia are still human they are created in the image of God and they are still human and they they can still um, benefit they can still contribute listen like Lisa's dad he is still contributing when she takes him to the greenhouse he is still contributing why not why not engage our loved ones in activities that they are still able to do it doesn't need to be the best quality we're not going for quality of task we're not going for quality of what the what the end product looks like I don't care what the end product looks like who cares whether the t-shirts folded upright who cares I don't care did they do something that they felt like they were still um, participating in the world absolutely who cares whether the dishes um, aren't perfectly put away in the closet right engage our loved ones with dementia we can do, do we there's so much that we can do so I'm passionate about occupational therapy I am passionate about being able to actually engage our loved ones but if you have if you have truly got people in your lives that are struggling you need to look in the community for the dementia specialists because guess what not all neurologists are the same not all doctors are the same I love doctors don't get me wrong they're great at what they do they're the ones that write our orders, right? They're the gatekeeper. I've got to go through the gatekeeper. But what, 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 not all doctors specialize. Like, if you truly have a heart condition that only one doctor can fix, 
don't you think you want to go to that one doctor? Because guess what? He may not know how to treat a UTI properly because he doesn't specialize in UTIs. Um, but man, he's going to know how to fix your heart. So when you have a loved one with dementia, why are you not looking for people in the community who specialize in dementia? Um, I think that we need to we need to be advocating for our dementia specialists. Uh, we need our dementia specialists to step up and we need to start taking, um, a encouraging people to find us in the community. There's 20 something thousand, 32,000 people on this group. And I, you know, I'm, I'm able to get a hold of five to 10 here and there, right? But each of us in our uni unique situations and in our unique areas, um, specialize in in dementia and we're out there start reaching out to us because guess what we will be able to help you because we have specialized in dementia and dementia care a asif thank you for joining i'm so glad you're a physical therapist and if you um have a loved one in your family that you that you need help with please reach out to either me or melissa we are here to help we are here to serve and so i have um another question on here that carol asked unless somebody out here is um, wanting to ask a question. Um, I got very passionate there. There are about nine people out there still. Um, if you have a specific question for me, here is a question from Carol. I'm going to tag Carol in this later on. Um, any hints on getting a person to shower? Oh, that is so wonderful a question. And, you know, that is, I, I, I hate to say this, but, um, you know, bathing can be a battle, um, but you got to pick your battles. Um, so, Carol, I'm just going to speak in generalities. That's all I can do right now, right? I'm, I'm not able to uh, specifically answer this question. I can answer it in generalities. Can you tell bathing is something that is um, a challenge for a lot of people? So, I totally understand. So when I look at what you said, any hints on getting the person to shower? So much jumps out at me, right? How old are they? Uh, did they shower when they were a kid? Are they afraid of water? Um, what time of day are you trying to do it? Is Are you very, yeah, it is a hot topic, isn't it? No pun intended. Are you trying to get them to uh, are they? Did they have a near drowning experience as a child? Uh, so much, so much. Um, um, yes, Dan, I will, after I answer this one on the um, showering. So much is out there. So much is out there about bathing. So a few things that you want to consider, um, Carol, the few things that I want to ask is, you know, are you saying, um, do you want to take a shower? That's the first thing that pops in my head, because guess what? Um, all right, Tranel, um, so just listen and then put in comments and I'll try to kind of answer them throughout yours as well. So the first thing is, if you ask somebody with dementia, if you literally ask them, do you want to take a shower? Guess what? I can say I don't want to take a shower. Now I've got a problem. Never, ever, ever, ever ask them, do you want to? do something because guess what? They're an adult. If they're your spouse or if they're your child, now you say, oh, now you've said no. All right. Now, now we're like spot on. Um, we, we're full on argument, right? I don't want to take a shower. You stink to high heaven. You got to take a shower. Okay. So never say, do you want to take a shower? Second thing is set yourself up for success on the front end, right? Um, a couple of things that I've seen people do is get everything or what I've suggested to for people to do is get everything ready in the bathroom, have everything ready. The environment needs to be enticing. Um, we got to ask questions, right? Why are they afraid of showering? Um, are they, is the whole bathroom white? Can they not tell where the tub is, where the, where they're supposed to sit, where they're supposed to stand? Do they always bath? Did they never shower? Okay, so all of these kinds of things. But if you really want to do a shower, first step, get the environment ready. Make sure that the environment is safe. Do they have a place to sit? Um, do they feel safe in the shower when they get there? Um, can you get a handheld sprayer so you're not putting um, water in their face, right? Um, is the bathroom warm enough? Are they are they cold? Are they um, afraid that they're going to slip and 
fall? Um, are they embarrassed? A lot of people, and um, this is particularly true of women, women might have been, um, and you are correct, Melissa, that's true. Um, it, women might have been molested as a child and never has ever said anything to anyone. And now you're coming and you're trying to wash their private parts, right? So some strategies channel that you can try is try to have them do as much as they're able. So people with dementia, they're they're one of so if, if this is if this is where they're functioning care people, care providers, either overestimate what they're able to do or underestimate what they're able to do. Um, and frequently therapists, and what makes us therapists, is we are better at guessing what they're able to do because we've been trained to observe and see what they're able to do. So if you have somebody who um, is struggling to shower, um, are you doing everything for them and they feel like they're out of control? Um, give them the washcloth. Say step by step, you know, do I need to sequence them? Wash your face, mom, wash your arms. Okay, let's wash it. Okay, now wash your private parts and let them do what they can, right? So all of those are some strategies that you can try, uh, Miss Carol. Um, and you want to also remember that um, a lot of times, and this is something that's harder for family members to get to, but you don't actually have to shower to get clean. You don't. So if it's that much of a battle, don't shower. Do a sponge bath. There can be so many reasons for why somebody is not wanting to take a shower. So can you know when? So take yourself back out of the equation and ask. Does it really matter? Does it really matter that they have to take a shower? Have to take a shower? So no, it doesn't. You can, you know, when when people were living in the in the 1800s, right? They are um, they are the ones that uh, only sponge bathed. They only sponge bathed. So why don't we sponge bathe? Go give them a great situation where they feel safe in sponge bathing. So never, ever, ever make bathing a battle. So Tranel, if you're still on there, don't make bathing a battle. So earlier on in the program, so when afterwards you can go back and, and watch, we talked about behaviors, right? Behaviors um, always are their way, a person with dementia's way of trying to communicate something to you. So they may be communicating, I'm afraid, I'm cold, I am I'm bashful. Um, so Melissa has a book. Um, you, it's the it's in the comments. It's linked in the comments. It's a behavior journal. It's a behavior diary. So what you need to do is you've got to write this information down because you need to turn into a dementia detective. Anybody who is dealing with the with the battle of bathing, and it's literally called the battle of bathing. Um, you got to know. You got to write. Sorry, my cat's scratching my couch. I almost yelled at him. Um, you got to know what's the trigger. So a behavioral diary truly can make a difference. And yes, Charles, Melissa is the one with the book. Um, the, uh, and I am writing my book, but I am doing lots of things. So um, there you go. Melissa also says, yes, tell them they're going to an important activity that has value to them. Um, and just ask yourself, is this worth the battle? Uh, nobody can answer that for you. You have to answer that for yourself. Nobody can answer that. So Dan asked, a couple of weeks ago, I talked about the differences between pull-up disposable underwear and the tab type. Yes, I can answer that. Can I revisit that? So there actually is a, a fairly big difference between the two. So a pull-up, <laughs> yeah, I have lots of good names. Um, so a pull-up, what is the difference between a pull-up and a tab? So two primary differences. Well, well, there are a lot of differences, but but one of the biggest differences is in amount, amount of uh, absorption. So a pull-up is truly, um, Dan, only designed to prevent. So let's talk about incontinence. What's the definition of incontinence? So. Um, a woman or somebody can be entirely incontinent of bladder and nobody ever know, right? Um, if you can manage that by yourself and you never soil your outer clothing, you can be considered continent because nobody knows and um, your outer clothing didn't get soiled. So when we are, when we are um, 
grading people on continents, one of the things that we look at is can they manage their own incontinence. If you can manage like somebody with a spinal cord injury or so on, if they can catheterize themselves their continent, if they can if they can manage their bowel and bladder function without other people knowing, you can be considered continent even though you're not making it to the bathroom in time or you're wetting your or you're wetting your protective underwear, your protective clothing. So a pull-up is designed to be able to contain enough liquid to be able for you, if you know you've got to go to, but you cannot make it in time, um, you know, you can't make it entirely to the bathroom in time to prevent you from wetting your clothes on the outside. Uh, that is what a pull-up is designed for. It is not... Um, specifically um, designed to uh, absorb um, an entire bladder accident. It's designed to absorb um, parts of a bladder accident, not the entire bladder accident, right? So that's one difference. The second is it looks more like clothing, right? And um, But it truly is just designed for a limited amount. Um, then a tab time type, it's in the comments, Charles. Melissa's book is, is tagged in the comments, so you should be able to just scroll back through the comments and find it. She put a link in there for us. Um, so the tab kind, Dan, excuse me, the tab kind is actually designed for quantity of urine. So that is the biggest difference. Um, the biggest difference is how much urine is um, absorbed in the um, in the one with tabs. The other difference is it is easier for a person with dementia um, to still put on the um, pull-up kind. Now I actually, and I'll link this later on, I'm not going to do it right this second, but on my um, YouTube channel I have a video uh, of me showing people how to change a pull-up without taking somebody's shoes and socks off. And I promise I'm decent, it doesn't look like I am, I do have leggings on, um, but I want you to go look at that. That's also a great resource for you because um, the harder part, so when, when Dan, what what will happen over time is it's it's harder for people when they're unless they're really good at at this to change a tab type of a brief in standing. It's a lot harder. You have to have um, the person has to have pretty good balance. Still, so you you have to be able to let, you know, let go of them. Um, and so sometimes the pull up kind is a little easier uh, to be able to manage. But if you have to take shoes and socks off, that makes it a little harder. So in the comments later on, I will actually link my little video, my little embarrassing video that's had 80 views um, of me dropping my drawers on Facebook um, to show people how to <laughs> how to change a pull up without taking someone's shoes and socks off. So I'll put that out there for you guys. But Dan, I hope that answered your question about the primary differences between a pull up and a brief. Um, some of the other differences are that um, when you get to the brief stage, truly get to the brief stage, um, you know, oftentimes that person is truly in continent. It's not to get them off. Getting them off is easy, but how do you get them back on without taking your shoes and socks off um, on a pull-up? So that's the trick. There's a trick to be able to get for a care provider, because your mom can cut them off, but if she, unless she's just wearing skirts and then puts them on over her feet, uh, which would be easy, or a dress, um, the way that, the only way that you can then put a pull-up on is by taking your pants off, is by taking your shoes and socks and pants off, so, or not necessarily socks, but your pants and shoes. So, yes, I will, I will link that out there for you guys. Um, and wonderful. I have thoroughly enjoyed myself. I'm so glad I figured out my, my comments again. Um, so I am super, super excited to be here. Um, Lisa Gardner um, Chandler also asked a question about bathing, so um, I will tag her in this as well. Um, and then I had a couple of more questions that I thought I would just answer real quick. Um, all right, one said, um, 
today is the day my mom is going to a long-term care. I feel like I'm throwing her away. Uh, this was Sabrina. I have so much guilt. So Sabrina, I'm going to tag you in this um, as well. I told my brothers if I see a decline in her being unhappy, we'll pull her out and hire 24-hour care. We kind of talked about this um, earlier, Miss um, Sabrina. You have to, have to um, take into consideration the whole household. So um, don't feel guilty. If you have loved, if you love your mom, uh, you've made the the best decision you can for your mom. Um, I answered a question about this earlier in this, so I will post it. Um, but reach out if you have any questions about that. And then um, the last one I'm going to answer today is that um, is from a gentleman by the name of Rulof, and the re reason I picked this is because he's from South Africa, and if you haven't watched me before, I am from South Africa originally. So Rulof, Yiriyana is for you. Um, his question was, is it advisable for Alzheimer's patients to be vaccinated against COVID, especially those who have been admitted to an Alzheimer's co care unit? So I thought that was a great question. And Rulof, the only thing that you can do is make the best decision for you and your loved one, right? Um, I am not anti-vaccination. I am not afraid of vaccinations. I um, know there are people who are. Um, my husband chose not to be vaccinated. I work in healthcare. I chose to be vaccinated. My parents chose to be vaccinated. They are in the older group. Having said that, um, I believe that uh, that you have to do the best for you and your loved one. And when you're in a facility, you may need to consider that being vaccinated is going to put them in a better um, better position to uh, be protected against COVID. It's like, I don't think we know enough about COVID yet. I truly do not. I have seen people who who are never the same after getting it. I've seen people who have never even known that they had it. Um, there just seems to be no rhyme or reason. I see people who have had COVID have cognitive impairment afterwards that they didn't have before. I have seen people who have gotten the vaccination, who had nothing wrong and then were extremely sick after the vaccination. I've seen the whole thing. I've seen the whole whole gamut of it. Um, I don't think that we know enough about COVID to know exactly. Having said that, though, the thing that we got to remember is, you know, if you go back in, in history to, uh, say, the polio vaccine or, um, you know, polio was mostly eradicated, right? All of these vaccines, somebody had to be first. We had to, we had to vaccinate people in order for, um, polio to be eradicated, right? And so, what did those people, we even know more than they did at that time. So, all I can say is that you need to speak to their physician. You need to consider that they are living in a place where you have no control over who's coming in to see them, whether that person has been in contact with somebody with um, COVID. Having said that, COVID is a virus that um, is probably never going away. It is going to be like the flu. It's going to come back every year. I hate to say that. I'm a negative Nelly, right? Um, but we have to consider that the more people over time People are always going to die of COVID now. People are always going to die of the flu. People are always going to die of pneumonia. There are people who are always going to die of other things that are communicable things, um, um, MRSA or other things, bugs, right? So we cannot protect everybody all the time. Having said that too, all of us are going to die. Um, I'm like I said at the beginning, I'm a believer. All of us are going to die. So we know that... Um, at some point or another, you just have to make a decision. And so you just make the best decision you can for you and your loved one with the information that you have um, and be able to take care of that. Um, all right. <laughs> um, it's because, it, Lori, hey, Lori, yeah, you can watch it later. So that's funny because it's actually under the baffled brain. On this side, it's under the baffled brain. Now, Dementia Made Simple, Lori is a friend of mine up in, um, 
up in New York and we um, dialogue a lot. I um, think Different Dementia is my own private Facebook group which you guys are welcome to join um, and Dementia Made Simple is actually the program that I do in my own private Facebook group on a Tuesday night where I where I do some more of this. I'm trying to find, I found the, the happy spot for me with this program so I'm still trying to find my happy spot with my second one and the third one that I'm going to eventually do is going to be a podcast. So I have a lot of ideas, not a lot of time. Um, so yes, please watch the, the replay and know you're not simple. Um, I just have too many places for you to link up with me. Um, I should have made it simple and just kept one name, right? Um, so it is 9.05. My husband and I are fixing to go, fixing to go. I live in South Carolina. Uh, we're getting ready to go up to Greenville, South Carolina to go work on our on our duplex. Um, I'm going to end the program with what I end with every single week, which is the Lord bless you and keep you. And I will be back here again next Saturday, and I'll give you a report on my duplex and how it is coming along. I've got my paint clothes on, um, and it actually says I support Alzheimer's. So I don't know if you guys can see that. So thank you for joining me today. I appreciate all of you. Um, I love coming on here and seeing you guys. Um, please come back next week. If you like what you see, please invite your friends to watch. Um, share these um, videos with other people who have dementia. I'm trying to get this education out there to people. So thank you, everybody, for being here. And I will be back again next week. Blessings. Bye.